All right, these are the notes for basic chemistry for AP Biology. So first of all, you might be thinking, why are we studying chemistry when this is a biology course? And if you think about it, there are tons and tons of atoms and compounds in our body. And so the processes of life and these chemical reactions are basically chemistry. So we need to have a basic understanding of chemistry in order to understand biology. Um, we're going to... Through chemistry, we're going to learn about and be able to understand the structure of living things. We can understand DNA. We can understand how energy supports life. And so we are going to get into the molecular and the chemical nature of life by studying basic chemistry. All right, elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical reactions. There are six elements that are important for biology that make up over 98% of the mass of living organisms. So make sure you know these six, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus. Um, if you were gonna add one more to that, that would be sulfur. Um, other elements are important too, but are present in smaller quantities. Atoms are the smallest forms of matter. They can retain the chemical characteristics of a given element. Um, atoms have a nucleus, which is in the center of the atom. Um, the nucleus contains protons, which we're going to abbreviate P, and neutrons, which are abbreviated N. They might not have any neutrons. And then outside of the nucleus, you're going to find the electrons, and we usually abbreviate that with E. Protons have a plus one charge, neutrons have no charge, and electrons have a minus one charge. All of the elements are grouped and organized in the periodic table. Um, if you're looking at a periodic table and you're looking at the columns going down, that is going to refer to the number of valence electrons. These are the electrons that are in the outer shell. The rows refer to the orbitals used for the ground state of the atom. So in other words, the rows tell where the electrons are located. We will be looking at this in class. Column 1 elements have only one electron in their valence shell. Column 2 will have two electrons, column 3 will have three electrons, etc. These elements can easily give up the electrons when they only have one. Columns 5, 6, and 7 elements need three, two, or one electrons to fill their outer shells, and these um, elements are electronegative, which we'll get into later. They pull electrons from other elements. Column 8 are the noble gases. They are inert. They are not reactive at all. So looking at a periodic table, you can see how these elements are organized into rows and into columns. And on each element, they give you the symbol, which for hydrogen is H. They give you the atomic number, which is one, which gives you the number of protons. It gives you the full name. Most, most periodic tables do give the full name. And then it will also give you the atomic mass right there. And then in this diagram, it's also showing you the Bohr diagram. Bohr is spelled B-O-H-R. And a Bohr diagram shows all of the valence electrons. So in column one right here, they only have one valence electron. So you can see there's one lonely electron in the orbital for that um, atom. And then you can see that carbon has six van um, electrons. And so you can see two are going to fit on the inner shell and four are going to fit on the outer shell. So we'll get into that in a minute. All right, the number of protons is called the atomic number. The atomic number will define that element. If the number of protons changes, then that element will change. If you take the number of protons and you add the number of neutrons to it, then you will get the atomic weight. In an uncharged atom, the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. Atoms that have different atomic weights are due to having a different number of neutrons, and these atoms are called isotopes. So carbon has um, isotopes. Carbon-12 is called carbon-12. The 12 refers to the atomic weight, which is the protons plus the neutrons. So on the left picture, it has six protons and six neutrons, which equals 12, and so that's why they call it carbon-12. But some carbon atoms might have more than six neutrons. And so the picture on the right is showing carbon-14. And if you look in the middle and you count them, because the neutrons are the gray ones, those, there's um, 
eight of them, so that's why it's called carbon-14, because six protons plus eight neutrons equals 14. All right, most times an atom will not have a charge. It will be a zero for a net charge of an atom, because a number of protons are going to equal the number of electrons. However, that doesn't always happen, especially during chemical reactions. If the number of electrons does not equal the number of protons, then we're going to call that atom an ion. So ions will have a charge. Um, and it all depends on how many electrons there are. If the ion is negative, like Cl minus 1, then it's going to be called an anion. If the atom or the ion is positive, like Mg, magnesium 2 plus, then that ion is called a cation. So cations are positively charged and ions are negatively charged. All right, so we're going to draw the Bohr model of hydrogen. We're going to draw hydrogen if it has no net charge. So for hydrogen, you're going to have um, the nucleus and we're going to have one proton, which we're going to symbolize as a positive charge. And because hydrogen is in the first row of the periodic table, that means it has one orbital. And in this hydrogen, there is no net charge, so the number of protons equal the number of electrons. And so you're going to have one electron on the orbital. And then let's say that it does have a charge. Hydrogen is an ion in this case. And so it lost its electron, so there are zero electrons, and there's only a proton. So you're still going to put the symbol in the middle. You're still going to show the proton. And it still is in row 1, so you're going to draw that orbital. But there will be no electrons on that orbital. And so because it lost an electron, it has a charge of plus 1. All right, just a clarification. Orbitals are the location or the space that's occupied by the electrons. Each orbital has two spaces for electrons. The energy level of the electrons are called shells. Shells can have one or more orbitals within them. The outermost shell is the valence shell, and so that would be like this one right here. Um, the farther away the electron is from the nucleus, the greater its potential energy. All right, so atoms react only when they come very close to each other. This is called the collision theory. Atoms may stick together and form molecules, which are combinations of atoms. If a molecule is formed from more than one element, it's called a compound. Um, and you don't really have to worry about the molecular weights. So when atoms bond together, we call that linkage a bond. Bonds come about because of the reorganization of these electron structures in the valence shells of the constituent atoms. And we'll see two different types of um, these bonds. Well, actually more than two, but two main ones. All biological reactions involve some sort of reorganization of these bonds. Bond reorganization results from the uptake or the release of energy. Bond energy is the energy needed to break a given bond. Okay, so one of the main bonds that we study in biology is covalent bonds. In covalent bonds, we're going to have sharing of electrons um, between these atoms. So... Let me look at the example. You have two atoms of hydrogen. Each of them have a proton, and you can see the electron. We're looking at the electrons in this case. Hydrogen wants to have two electrons in this orbital. This orbital can fit two. It really wants to have two, but it can't have two by itself because it only has one electron there. So if you have two atoms of hydrogen, they can share their um, their electrons and form a bond and that is how you get a molecular hydrogen or H2 which would be drawn H with a line H and that line represents the bond which is representing two shared electrons. Another example down here is two atoms of oxygen. Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. It wants eight. That first orbital can hold two, that second orbital can hold eight. But in oxygen, there's only six. So oxygen really wants to get two more electrons. Each oxygen wants to get two more electrons. So they will share two sets of electrons and make a double bond and become stable. When methane is formed, carbon is sharing, four, sharing its electrons with four hydrogen atoms. 
And so they, they write that out using a Lewis structure diagram. Um, they use dots to represent the number of electrons in the valence shells of atoms. So carbon has four valence electrons and hydrogens have one. And so when you put them all together and they're all sharing, that forms methane and that's what it would look like. That's called a Lewis dot structure. Um, this one is called a structural model, and that's the one I talked about last slide, where you have the line in between. So instead of the two dots representing the shared pair of electrons, they just draw a line between the C and the H. Sometimes you will see in diagrams that they don't even write the line, and they might just write CH, and that line is implied. All right, the other type of major bond that you will see in biology is an ionic bond. In ionic bonds, the electrons are donated by one atom and given to another. Um, an electronegative atom is going to steal the electron from another atom to fill its valence shell. Remember, all atoms want to have eight valence electrons in that outer shell. So the typical example that you look at for an ionic bond is in salt. Salt is sodium and chloride. And so you can see the Bohr diagrams here on the right. Sodium has 11 electrons, so they're going to have two on the first shell. Then you're going to have eight on the next shell, right? And then you have one more because there's 11. So there's one lonely electron that sodium has, and it doesn't want it. It wants to have a full outer shell. So sodium has an extra electron that it would like to get rid of. Chlorine has 17 electrons, and you can see the Bohr diagram here, that on its outer shell it ends up having seven and it really wants one more. So it works out perfectly. Sodium is going to give its electron to chlorine. So sodium is going to lose an electron and become positive. Chlorine is going to gain an electron and become negative. So that positive and that negative charge that results attract, and that's what forms sodium chloride, which is salt. Just a little side note about salt. Um, Salt dissolves in water. Water is called a solvent. The salt is called a solute. And to be able to dissolve in water, solutes, like salt, must be polar or ionic. And we'll get into that word polar later. All right, there are two types of covalent bonds. There are nonpolar covalent bonds and polar covalent bonds. Polar covalent bonds um, result when Atoms are not sharing those electrons equally. Um, and nonpolar covalent bonds, they're sharing those electrons equally, which is what we showed in the example earlier. Um, water is an example of a pole that has a polar covalent bond. It does not share those electrons equally. Because oxygen is electronegative, it really wants those electrons more. And hydrogen is so weak that it can't handle it. So when water is formed by covalent bonds, Oxygen actually pulls those electrons more toward its nucleus, and so the oxygen ends up having more of a negative charge, and the hydrogens end up having a little bit of a positive charge on their nucleus. And so this creates polarity, and that's what um, creates a lot of different water properties. One other bond that we're going to talk about is hydrogen bonds. Obviously, hydrogen is needed to form a hydrogen bond. And so what happens is hydrogen is going to be covalently bonded to an electronegative atom. Um, electronegative atoms are oxygen, which I just showed you, nitrogen, and sulfur. These are the two that we mainly look at. Um, note that all of these elements need electrons to fill their valence shells. All right, the last topic that we have is the different types of chemical reactions. Um, this is mainly going to be seen when we do cellular respiration and photosynthesis, so this is just an introduction. Um, rearrangement um, chemical reactions, obviously the atoms are going to be rearranged. Synthesis reactions, we're going to have small molecules making larger molecules. Degrade, degradation reactions, we're going to have large molecules breaking down. Um, and then displacement reactions, we're going to have one atom or more than one atom replacing other atoms. Um, these reactions occur in pairs, and that's what our next reaction that we're going to talk about, the big one is, um, where energy of one reaction is going to drive another reaction. So the main that one that we learn about in AP Biology is reduction and oxidation. Um, reduction is the gain of an electron. 
Oxidation is the loss of an electron. Sometimes we learn that as oil rig, O-I-L, oil, oxidation is loss, rig, reduction is gain. So that might help you remember it. Um, there are abbreviated as redox reactions, and there are reactions where there's an electron being transferred from one atom to another atom. So one atom is going to lose the electron, and the other atom is going to gain the electron. Um, this transfer of an electron involves transfer of energy. Um, so there's a loss of energy, and when you're gaining an electron, you're gaining energy. So last slide, in a redox reaction, one atom is losing an electron, and the other atom is gaining an electron. There's always, this is always happening together, simultaneous. Um, for example, when iron oxidizes, it loses electrons to oxygen. So iron is oxidized and oxygen is reduced. Um, and so we will see this again in cellular respiration in our photosynthesis unit.